Hello, and welcome to the For We Are Many podcast, or the Bread Theory podcast. I guess it depends on uh, where you're watching from. So how are you doing today, Zach? Not too bad, and thank you for the follow, Freddy uh, Lachance. Uh, we're doing State and Revolution tonight, so I hope you're into that sort of thing. I'm doing pretty well today. Um, yeah, it, was a, it was a really nice day out here. Um, just, you know, I do landscaping as my day job, and I was out on a, a green rooftop just pulling weeds and enjoying wildflowers, so not too bad for me. How, how's your day? Yeah, doing? not too bad. Um, as you see, I'm not in my usual office. I am not even in the valley. I am in northern Arizona. So I took advantage of the 70 something degree weather and, you know, went for a walk with the dogs in the woods. Oh, that sounds great. No complaints. No complaints. Very cool. Very cool. So we're on to, to chapter four of, of State and Revolution already. It seems like we're flying through this book. Doesn't it? It's like I, I feel like it goes a lot quicker with the audio book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can definitely take uh, longer pauses in between. Um, and it definitely saves your voice, too. <laughs> definitely. I learned that one the hard way when I did chapter one. <laughs> right. Oh, wasn't ready for that yet. Oh, no, <laughs> um, Emily said hello. It's always good to see you. Hello, Emily. How are you doing tonight? I've really been uh, enjoying getting more and more used to Restream. It just looks so much more professional and Zoom did. It really does. It really does. I got I to gotta get used to it, too. I just, there's a few things about it that I can't quite get it to work. But, um, yeah, I definitely got to do the Restream more. And, it, you know, it saves editing, too. You know, just <laughs> Amen the, to that. The, the full thing out on YouTube without having to, you know, go through and edit every little bit. So, that's nice as well. Amen to that. Do you want to just uh, jump right in, or do you have anything you want to plug first? Or um, no, uh, if you, if you guys are unfamiliar with me, uh, you guys watching um, the restream, uh, I'm Bread Theory. I'm Zach. I, I do uh, usually theory audiobooks, and then every weekend I've been doing stuff on permaculture lately. Um, so we just had a good one on, on Toby Hemingway's The Permaculture City. Uh, where he's trying to apply permaculture principles and ethics to uh, designing cities and communities and stuff like that. It was, it was a really good one. Um, so, yeah, every every Sunday night at around, you know, 6, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, that's when I do that one. And then I've been doing this this uh, theory stream with For We Are Many for the past few Wednesdays here. Um, so, yeah, if you want to check out my stuff, uh, you can find all my links on my link tree at linktr dot ee slash bread underscore theory and uh it'll take you to all the stuff that that i do hell yeah hell yeah um you can also go to for we are to check out our content uh we're a little bit behind in getting stuff posted to it oh, although awesome. this um this stream is actually live on the website so uh at least we're getting back into the groove of yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. That is helpful. Uh, do you think you could turn your mic up just a little bit? Sure. Let's see what I can do here. Um, like, I mean, I mean, I can understand you just fine. I'm just figuring if somebody's watching on a phone and not through headphones, it might be right. kind of hard to hear. Yeah. Um, let's see where I can toggle that. Uh, oh, yeah. Mine's really low. I thought it was, because usually you're quite a bit louder than that. Let's see if that works a little bit. Oh, yeah, that's clear as First, day. It was on my USB camera mic for some reason. So. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, yeah, so and I've moved my camera back since the last time we streamed, so no wonder it was so soft. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. All right, well, I guess uh, let's dive right in. Yeah, let's do it. Um, oh, Actually, let me drop in the chat first the link to the book on the Marxist Internet Archives if uh, you want to follow along and don't happen to have 
a paper copy. All right, that's posted to the feed on YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, and Facebook. Cool. Sweet. Very good. All right. Um, uh, rolling. Oh wait, I might want to add it to the stream first. There we go. Now rolling. <laughs> and that is the end of chapter three. Now beginning chapter four, supplementary explanations by Engels. Marx gave the fundamentals concerning the significance of the experience of the commune. Engels returned to the same subject time and again, and explained Marx's analysis and conclusions, sometimes elucidating other aspects of the question with such power and vividness that it is necessary to deal with his explanations specially. Section 1. The Housing Question In his work, The Housing Question, Engels already took into account the experience of the commune and dealt several times with the tasks of the revolution in relation to the state. It is interesting to note that the treatment of this specific subject clearly revealed, on the one hand, points of similarity between the proletarian state and the present state, points that warrant speaking of the state in both cases, and, on the other hand, points of difference between them, or the transition to the destruction of the state. Quote, How is the housing question to be settled, then? In present-day society, it is settled just as any other social question, by the gradual economic leveling of demand and supply, a settlement which reproduces the question itself again and again, and therefore is no settlement. How a social revolution would settle this question not only depends on the circumstances in each particular case, but is also connected with much more far-reaching questions, one of the most fundamental of which is the abolition of the antithesis between town and country. As it is not our task to create utopian systems for the organization of the future society, it would be more than idle to go into that question here. But one thing is certain there is already a sufficient quantity of houses in the big cities to remedy immediately all real housing shortage, provided that they are used judiciously. This can naturally only occur through the expropriation of the present owners and by quartering in their houses homeless workers or workers overcrowded in their present homes. Could you pause it right as there? As soon as the yeah. proletariat has won political... It seems to me that, that what he's talking about, where there's there's an overabundance of housing stock that, that could house, house everyone easily. seems to me that that's still very much the case today, especially yeah. in, in uh, uh, some of the larger cities where you get a lot of land speculators, uh, you know, cities where people, where Airbnb is really popular, where people have multiple properties and stuff like that. So just doing away with uh, landlords and, and doing away with um, allowing people to have multiple residencies that are, that are meant for residential, um yeah we could we could easily house everybody everybody like six times over yeah but yeah we have a manufactured housing scarcity right uh, because we have all these developers buying up houses and sitting on them right or you know charging a ridiculous amount for rent just because people will pay it yeah um i got a couple comments in our chat to catch up on caitlin says hey <laughs> hello nice to see you hey caitlin uh, John is back. He's our newest patron. Uh, the first time I saw him in the chat was just last night. So Very cool. obviously we made a good impression. I'm pretty way stoked to, about that. Way to step up. That's really great. Yeah. And uh, of course, Natalie says hi all. Hello, Natalie. Hello, Natalie. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess I just want to piggyback off of what you were saying. Yeah. Um, that is very much the case today. It's all a manufactured <laughs> scarcity. Uh, we are all acutely aware of that at this point. Um, I guess that in society more broadly, there's just still the question of what do we do? Right. Um, that's part of the reason I wanted to read this book. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, ideally, we would we would first decommodify housing. Like yes, when when you have a profit motive in something that people need to to live, housing is, is a pretty basic thing to to live. Then of course, people are gonna pursue that profit motive over housing people even. Um, so yeah, I mean it's small wonder that that there's so many homeless people, uh, even in the the richest nation in history. Um, 
yeah, it's because it's because we we put profit over people, literally. Yeah, and um, housing is certainly not the only industry where that's a problem. Uh, healthcare, so. holy okay. shit! Oh, just the 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 amount of administrative waste. I mean, they talk about the efficiency of the the private sector and all that <laughs> stuff in the marketplace. It's all just bullshit. Uh, you look at countries that that have uh, some sort of socialized medicine program, some sort of universal health care, incredibly lower overhead costs because you don't have uh, people working with, you know, billing and and uh, dealing with uh, health insurance providers and all this. It's all just centralized into one place, you know. The, the government pays for the, the services. You don't have to worry about being in or out of network because it's all the network. Uh, it's just so wasteful the way we do things. And yeah. It, and, and it's such a sham that, that it's been, been sold to us that this is somehow more efficient and we get better care as a result. Because cert certainly some people do, but you, you really have to pay uh, quite a lot of money. And that's, that's unattainable for the average person. Absolutely. Um, I guess just to throw it out there, any of us that are on this stream or in the chat, we're we're not we're not in the club right yeah no I, I'm, I'm still working on trying to get health care through my my state offered program and it's just been it's been a long process but i can't get it i can't even get it through my work yet i haven't been working there long enough so. oh wow uh john said much more efficient and i mean yeah like look at countries like cuba for yeah. example i mean there's never a question of hey how can you pay for this never never yeah. once they got a world class system, one one of the best in the world, um, and that's despite having a a how many decades U.S. embargo on on so many of their trade goods. Yeah, and they have such a hard time getting medical equipment because you know the embargo doesn't necessarily affect food and medicine, but it does affect medical equipment. Right. And a lot of the countries just straight up feel threatened by the United States. So even though they legally can trade uh you know food and medicine with cuba uh most that do trade with the united states are afraid of losing yep. said trade with the united states yep yeah we're, we, we use that as as a cudgel around the world um all because back in the 70s some some you know uh rich casino tycoons lost all their land and some rich sugarcane <laughs> plantation owners lost their land so it's all just to, uh, to settle a, a decades-old grudge. Yeah. Natalie said, when government is owned by the corporations and oligarchs, bad shit happens. Healthcare is a human right. right. Exactly. Yeah, we, we've got to have government for, of, and by the people. And when, when government can be bought and sold, uh, when it's basically just another commodity, then, then you can't get that sort of a system. Right. All right. Back to the text. Back to the text. Political power, such a measure prompted by concern for the common good, will be just as easy to carry out as our other expropriations and billetings by the present day state, unquote. The change in the form of state power is not examined here, but only the content of its activity. Expropriations and billetings take place by order even of the present state. From the formal point of view, the proletarian state will also, quote, order the occupation of dwellings and expropriation of houses. But it is clear that the old executive apparatus, the bureaucracy, which is connected with the bourgeoisie, would simply be unfit to carry out the orders of the proletarian state. Quote, it must be pointed out that the actual seizure of all the instruments of labor, the taking possession of industry as a whole by the working people, is the exact opposite of the Proudhonist redemption. In the latter case, the individual worker becomes the owner of the dwelling, the peasant farm, the instruments of labor. In the former case, the working people remain the collective owners of the houses, factories, and instruments of labor, and will hardly permit their use, at least during a transitional period, by individuals or associations without compensation for the cost. In the same way, the abolition of property in land is not the abolition of ground rent, but its transfer, if in a modified form, to society. The actual seizure of all the instruments of labor by the working people, therefore, does not at all preclude the retention of rent relations." Unquote. 
we shall examine the question. I paused it a little bit late there, but um, mm -hmm. I guess I wanted to once again talk about, uh, well, what Ingalls just said there. Mm -hmm. um, it must be pointed out that the actual seizure of all the instruments of labor, all the instruments of labor, just wanted to reiterate that, as a whole by the working people, is the exact opposite of the Prudonis uh, redemption. So um, in the latter case, the individual worker becomes the owner of the dwelling, the peasant farm, the instruments of labor. In the former case, the working people remain the collective owners of the mm -hmm. houses, factories, and instruments of label, labor and will hardly permit their use, at least during yada, yada, yada. Yeah. The point is, is power to the people. Yeah. Um, definitely. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's really all I wanted to say. Yeah. Um, John in our chat said healthcare is a whip to the unemployed and a change shackle to those employed. And yes, I, I couldn't have said it better myself, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we, we've definitely been seeing those, those sorts of, uh, um, ways of cajoling people into, to working, uh, we've seen the mask kind of slip on that recently with uh, the, the uh, unemployment benefits and how there's there's so many places that uh, are like, oh, sorry, we can't, we, you don't, no one wants to work anymore. I can't get enough employees here and stuff like that because unemployment's too good. And like, I've even heard my boss complain about it. Like, no one wants to work this job because unemployment's too good. It's like, well, I mean, doesn't that kind of show you there? that the reason they don't want to work is because they would be making less money than, than even the government's offering them right now uh, right. to do work that they're not going to see most of, of the profit from. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, um, absolutely. But, but definitely healthcare is, is another one of those things. It's another one of those ways that they can try and, you know, needle you into to accepting employment because it is, especially in the U.S., is, is so closely tied to your employment. Um, yeah. And there's no way to escape that, really. At least not no. that I've found. <laughs> not unless you go on, not unless your state uh, has its own program or, or you can get on to um, Obamacare or whatever. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, just one thing that I wanted to bring up when he's talking about the, the, the state seizing all the, the properties and then redistributing it to all the people that need housing and stuff. This, this sounds a lot like um, uh, The Conquest of Bread. I'm, I'm getting like echoes of, of reading that book because Kropotkin said basically the same thing is, is after the overthrow of the old order, the first thing you should do is redistribute housing and stuff like that. The only difference, like the only difference that I can see so far is that uh, Kropotkin was like, well, just things orders will naturally arise where people who are interested in housing will get together and, and take inventory of, of housing. And then he, he mentioned like clothing and a bunch of different things, just take inventory an inventory of the, the resources of the city and then distribute it equitably. Whereas as Lenin is saying that that should rather be a, a centralized um, process. Um, and I can definitely see merits to both, but yeah. uh one, once again, we're seeing that, that the, the Marxist-Leninist view of things and uh, the, at, at least the anarcho-communist view of things are not all that different. It's just mainly a difference in the way they want to go about doing things. Yeah, I mean, honestly, we're learning that little by little in uh, anarchism and other essays as well. I mean, there's a lot more overlap than I expected there to be, <laughs> yeah. honestly. Yeah, um, I'm not so impressed. I mean, in retrospect, I shouldn't have been surprised, but you know how how these differ, uh, how these differences get played up on the internet. Yeah. Oh my God, internet leftists are something, and I guess that's rich yeah. coming from an, a dude on the internet. But I mean, I yeah, mean, both of us really. I mean, we right. literally. <laughs> how many places are we streaming to right now at this moment? <laughs> a few. A few. A few. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um, um, I put the chat overlay on our stream. Um, I just uh, wanted to throw that out. If anybody wants to hop in the comments, it'll actually just show on the screen instead of yeah. having to click each individual comment. Yeah, that, that's really helpful for me too because I don't have to scroll up and down and I can keep the, the pain centered. So I like that. 
Indeed. Um, yeah, I guess back to the text. I don't really yeah. have anything else to add there. Yeah, I don't think I do either. Yet. Um, we shall examine was the start of the line because I know that I kind of botched yeah. that. All right. Question touched upon in this passage, namely the economic basis for the withering way of the state in the next chapter. Engels expresses himself most cautiously, saying that the proletarian state would, quote, hardly permit the use of houses without payment, quote, at least during a transitional period. The letting of houses owned by the whole people to individual families presupposes the collection of rent, a certain amount of control, and the employment of some standard in allotting the housing. All this calls for a certain form of state, but it does not at all call for a special military bureaucratic apparatus, with officials occupying specially privileged positions. The transition to a situation in which it will be possible to supply dwellings rent-free depends on the complete withering away of the state. Speaking of the Blancists' adoption of the fundamental position of Marxism after the Commune, and under the influence of its experience, Engels, in passing, formulates this position as follows, quote, Necessity of political action by the proletariat and of its dictatorship as the transition to the abolition of classes and with them of the state, unquote. I wanted to cut it off there because, I yeah. mean, uh, I, f I feel like that's a very relevant uh, mm -hmm. quote. Um So basically, without the abolition of the class struggle, there can be no transition to the higher stage of communism. Right. Or anarchism. Yeah, yeah. Um, Natalie said in the chat, left Twitter is lethal instead of united for strength. Yeah. It's not just left Twitter. It's left Facebook. Yeah, and name your platform. It's... I don't know why. I mean, some people, it's just you read one book and you've decided that's going to be your entire personality now and anyone who says anything different is attacking you personally and you gotta like, <laughs> fight your crusades and all this stuff and right. for people that are young and like haven't haven't had all that much yet i guess i don't really blame them that much and i'm sure for some people they just enjoy being antagonistic and you know pretending like they have all the answers um but for people that should know better i i, I mean i guess Chasing clout is, is basically the only thing that I can think of as a, as a reason for keeping these antagonisms going. Because it's really not that different. I mean, even even talking about rent here, um, I don't interpret that as, as rent as the way that a landlord collects rent now, where they, they most of it's just pure profit. Um, because when he talks about the only way to have completely rent-free is to have the state wither away, which would mean we're in a moneyless and classless society. So at the point that there's no money, of course, you can't collect rent. Uh, but until that point, you do still need to maintain stuff. So that's what I, that's how I interpret that, is you still need to, to collect rent, which I think there probably should even be a different term for it, uh, like maintenance fees, I suppose. Um, but uh, yeah, because yeah, you still have to, ha as long as you're still going to have money, you still have to keep things up using money. So that's just my interpretation. Agreed. Agreed. Um, which, I mean, I, th I think, just to point out that, that, you know, there was some utopian or idealist um, I ideas, I guess, in Marxism-Leninism anyway, because, I, I mean, they just made it sound like the state was going to weather away overnight. I mean, obviously, that's been further refined by people that came after him, but... Right. I mean, it, it very much seems like he thought that it was going to be like a couple of months, not a couple of generations. Yeah. Um, are you are you saying Engels thought that, or, or are you saying like? Well, I mean, I, I I guess like Lenin's not really disagreeing with it. So yeah, it was it was Marx that, or I mean, sorry, it was Engels that initially implied it there. But uh, you know, Marx didn't you know, say anything like, well, this is a protracted dialectical process. It's going to take a lot longer than we initially thought, which I, I mean, there had been no uh, communist revolution that, that was actually successful in taking power prior to that. So, That's I true. Mean, you know, they were totally shooting in the dark. Yeah. Completely treading new ground. So, yeah, it's not surprising that they didn't know exactly how things were going to play out. Right. Right. 
Um, John replied to Natalie saying the left has opportunistic power seekers too. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. There's a lot of people that, that call themselves comrades that simply are not. If you're trying, if you're on the left to try to like establish power over somebody, like I, I just don't get that. I don't either. Like, I mean, that's, that's one side that, that, I mean, if you're going to be a grifter and you're just going to trick people into uh, following you so you can, you know, build money one way or another, you might as well pretend to be a right-leaning guy because then you can get into all the conspiracies and you can really stoke the fear and, and that's really going to be the most profitable. I mean, most of the, most of the out-and-out grifters you see out there, they're all right-wing for a reason. It's because there's money to be made and keeping people afraid and... Uh, pointing them at, at a, a specific enemy that you've, you've made up in your head. Um, and with the left, there's just not that. Like, I mean, Hassan talks about this all the time on his chat. He's like, if I really wanted to screw people over and be a grifter, I would start spouting right-wing stuff, and he'd be like 10 times as big. And I don't, I don't doubt that at all. Um, so, I mean, like the biggest channels out there on, not on Twitch, which is great so far but on uh youtube for sure some of the biggest channels out there are, are right-wing nut jobs who who uh uh yeah they, they they do it for the money agreed uh john commented we are already seeing social change take centuries and i think that's a big part of why china or china <laughs> why china changed their approach uh, so rapidly in the 70s and 80s, I think that they realized that the cultural re- uh, the cultural revolution could not be a six month process. <laughs> you know, like I, I mean, and I'm not like hating on them. There's there's no way to know until you try. But yeah, social change absolutely takes generations, and I think that we're in a period of mass social change and social awakening right now. Uh, Mm -hmm. If you look at the the last, I I mean, not even the whole last 10 years, but if you look at the last 10 years, you know, we had Occupy, which was a class-based movement, was in the streets for months. And then 2014, we had Black Lives Matter, the first wave of Black Lives Matter protest, uh, which was under Obama, by the way. Don't try to act like he was any better than Trump. He wasn't. He had the same fucking response. Mm -hmm. Um. But, you know, then obviously uh, the more things are out there, like Chauvin would not have been held accountable if there wasn't so much video of it and it hadn't been so widely distributed. And on top of that, he probably wouldn't have been fucking charged like he was if the third precinct wouldn't have broken, like, you know, wouldn't have burned to the ground. Yep. Um Yep, yeah. I mean, yeah, I know yeah, that yeah. propaganda uh, of the deed is a more anarchist ideal, and this is obviously we're reading State and Revolution, but uh, hello, if, the, if that's mm-hmm. not overlap, I don't know what is. Yeah, really, for sure, for sure. Yeah, um, and there, there would be so much more power to uh, the left if we weren't constantly trying to, f- it's, it, and for so many, it seems like they're trying to find those divisions to exploit. And if we didn't do that, and instead, I, I'm pretty sure we can all agree on, on at least getting rid of, ca- of capitalism. Uh, I'm pretty sure we can all agree on having a more fair, just, and equitable society and, and bringing more democracy to the workplace and to you know real democracy to government, government that's not controlled by, by capitalists and private interests. Uh, and those are some pretty powerful guiding stars uh, if we all just decide that that's what we're gonna to shoot for um so yeah i don't know yeah uh i mean honestly in terms of instituting direct democracy we have fucking computers that fit in our pockets Mm mm-hmm yep that's it that's that's i mean i'm not saying that i want an election system built in you know operated by Google or Apple. No, that's not what I'm saying, but use that technology. Right. Yeah. And, and, uh, if we were, uh, deploying technology to better humanity rather than, than just mainly for the profit motive, 
then then maybe we could build systems that that had integrity and and um, uh, trust that that we could use to to do more direct democracy, um, even if it wasn't necessarily binding elections, at least to get um, a sense of public support for things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Wade is in the, actually I skipped John, I'm sorry. John said power is the, prop, uh, the problem and Natalie responded saying power and personality disorders. Absolutely. Uh, Trump is a fucking textbook case of that shit. Yep. Uh, but John elaborated, power over others is an attempt to domesticate the human mm-hmm. and it is unnatural to be the prey of the predator. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that goes against human nature uh, to dominate one another. I, I, I think we would not have made it this far as a species uh, if we weren't at, at our hearts, you know, collaborative and, and uh, uh, symbiotic in, in a way with, with each other. Um, we're, we're social creatures. We, 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 from birth, are dependent on other people to completely selflessly take care of us because we... we you know, there's not a single baby that um, popped out of the womb and then was was out there foraging for food and, and sustenance. Uh, that's just who we are as as a species. So yeah. to do otherwise, to subjugate and to, um, you know, take from others, that that seems to me to go against what we're how we're hardwired, what we are. I agree. Um Wade said there could be time to debate or bicker after bringing down the common enemy. Fucking solidarity. Yeah. Our yeah. very first guest said back in February, you know, like we can have all these conversations about the role of the state or about uh, oppression or hierarchy after after we overthrow capitalism. Because if we do it before, we're never going to overthrow capitalism. Mm-hmm. Um, Natalie said, I've really started to realize that. Over the last year, I really thought Bernie was going to win. I was a little naive in politics. Weren't we all? (laughs) I mean, maybe not all of us, but I mean, I Bernie was the compromise for the left, and that's why so many people believed so fervently in him. Mm -hmm. Um, Absolutely true. Yeah, Um, but then we saw uh, capitalism protecting itself. because the Democrats at their heart, or at least in, in terms of their power structure, are just another right party, a right-leaning party. They, they are neoliberals at their core. They may have a, a progressive wing. Um, if you want to call it that. Wearing even if, dress, yeah, if you, if you wearing want to Wearing a dress it. isn't very well, progressive. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> that whole thing. <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys. If you were in the current event stream last night, I'm not going back down that rabbit hole. I just Y'all. wanted to crack a joke no oh, yeah i agree it's just it's one of those things it's like oh really and i could just see it coming as soon as it happened like okay this is what we're going to talk about for the next week well great <laughs> let's not yeah. talk about anything important let's just talk about <laughs> fashion choices and performative uh uh political nonsense stunts. really yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. that's that's all it is it's theatrics <laughs> and that's all that's all aoc's ever really been i i mean I don't get me wrong. I was hoping that she was going to go uh, into the house and be a voice of reason or, you yeah. know, be a voice of the left. And I, I, I did have a lot of hope for her, but pretty much as soon as she was there, she was sucking up to Pelosi and I knew it was all done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and unfortunately, um, even when they do try to, to put forward good legislation, there's just so few uh, on that wing that Pelosi steamrolls them every time. Um or, or they allow people like Cinema and Mansion to, to, you know, stymie them once more. I really don't think the Democrats like being in power. I think they are, are most comfortable being an opposition party so they can just whine and complain and, and be performative and all this stuff and never really have any accountability or really any expectation to get anything done because, oh, if only, if only we had the, the reins of power. But then when they get it, they just, they, it's like they're looking for any excuse to, to roll over. Oh, yeah. Just like, why have we never heard of the Senate parliamentarian until the Democrats needed an excuse to not fucking do anything? I know. And and when the Republicans <laughs> came into conflict with the Senate parliamentarian, 
they just fired him and they moved on. Uh, the Democrats could do the same. They they have the White House. Uh, I think he's controlled by um, the, the the president of the Senate, which is Kamala Harris. So she could right. just fire him and they can move along. And I mean, you know, that's that. They could get stuff done. But, you know, again, Natalie it's, oh, said, oh, sorry, I thought no, you were done. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Natalie said without unions... Well, without union, I think she meant unity. But without union, there will be there will not be change. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's, That's sure. the whole reason we're doing this. I, I mean, <laughs> unity is kind of at the core of everything left wing, <laughs> except for yep. maybe like egoism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That wasn't a stab either. I mean. <laughs> I feel like that's kind of a lot of people's default state at this point, you know? Like, I, I mean, what else do you do but try to fucking get by? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Yep. Anyway. See, see some more comments coming in. Oh, yeah. We don't really have a left party, Natalie said. The United <laughs> States is way backward versus many countries. Absolutely. Joy Absolutely. said, hey, nice to see you, Joy, uh, said the current Senate parliamentarian is a lady. I did not know that. Wade said they are politicians. I care nothing for any of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't say necessarily any, but any in power. Yeah, absolutely. I do support some green candidates. I do support some PSL candidates. I know they're never going to win, but I mean, if I'm throwing away my vote anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if there's ever going to be any change at the federal level, it's going to have to, to bubble up from the grassroots and there's just going to have to be a, a huge push at the very least to get things like, uh, you know, instant runoff voting or proportional representation or any of these other things. And, and that's certainly not going to bring us across the, the finish line of getting away, uh, you know, doing away with capitalism. But at least we could get to, say, like the, the level of a social democracy at that point. Um, yeah, which I, I mean would still be drastically better for our people, even though there's a lot of flaws with that. That would probably absolutely. still come at the expense of the global south. But I mean, maybe yeah. we could start, you know, decolonizing. Maybe we could start giving the indigenous people that fucking lived here for thousands of years some of their fucking land back. I'm just saying. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. It, it would definitely be uh, progress. But but yeah, again. Never going to be um, completely the the end goal, because um, you're still allowing the room for parties like the Republicans and the Democrats to then get back in the door and get back in power and move things backwards again. Um, yeah, yeah. So Wade said, "The system, though, there's no baby in that bathwater." <laughs> uh, and John said, "Both parties are bourgeoisie. Fuck yeah, they are. Fuck yeah, yeah they yeah. are." Yep. And yep. I, I think that's half of the point of this book is to point out that what we call democracy is still a fucking dictatorship. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's, uh, it, uh, like I, I think I said it in the last stream, it's, it's basically the way that, that you technically have the freedom to choose your master when you're looking for a job. Um, I, I suppose that is a sort of choice. We can choose who our political masters are. Um, and that, that's, that's about the extent of, at the federal level, that's about the extent of things. Um, but th those corporate interests, they, they always just assert themselves. Indeed. All right. Well, I guess we'll go back to the text. Yeah, let's get back to it. Uh, one more comment. Uh, Natalie said just a tub of dirty water and it needs drained. Mm hmm. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Addicts of hair splitting criticism or bourgeois exterminators of Marxism will perhaps see a contradiction between this recognition of the abolition of the state and repudiation of this formula as an anarchist one in the above passage from Anto Doring. It would not be surprising if the opportunists classed Engels too as an anarchist for it is becoming increasingly common with the social chauvinists to accuse the internationalists of anarchism. Marxism has always taught that with the abolition of classes, the state will also be abolished. 
The well-known passage on the withering away of the state in anti durham accuses the anarchists not simply of favoring the abolition of the state, but of preaching that the state can be abolished overnight. As now, the prevailing social democratic doctrine completely distorts the relation of Marxism to anarchism on the question of the abolition of the state. It will be particularly useful to recall a certain controversy in which Marx and Engels came out against the anarchists. So I guess before we move on to um, the controversy with the anarchists, <laughs> remember that infighting we were just talking about? Yeah. It's not new. <laughs> no, no, of course not. No, which I, I mean, I get it. it uh, I get it, though. At that point, they literally were on the verge of revolution. And I, I mean, these things needed to be worked out. Granted, were there mistakes made? Yeah. 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 Course. I mean, there probably was on both sides, but we don't I don't know of any way to get that information. Yeah. Um, anyway, though. uh Sorry, but the uh, in anti during um, they preach that the state. Oh, they accuse the anarchists uh, not simply of favoring the abolition of the state, but preaching that the state can be abolished overnight. So, like, they're even pointing out there that they don't disagree that the state needs to be abolished. It's just whether it's going to be a process or whether it's just going to be a smash and grab. Right. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, I mean, that is, that is certainly hair splitting criticism if it really comes down to it, mm -hmm. but that's all I wanted to say. Uh, do you want to have anything you want to add or do you want to just move on to section two? Uh, no, no, I, I think we can uh, move on. Right on. John said, serve yourself by serving the community. And, uh, ultimately that is what I take away from the mindset of the black Panther party. Yeah, that mutual aid, you know, mutual aid is, is not just giving to other people. It's, it's you know, building those bonds um, that later on you're probably going to need at, at some capacity yourself. Uh, so, yeah, it is serving yourself and it's, it's serving the future of, of people that you care about as well. So, yeah, definitely. Agreed. Uh, one more comment. Joy said abolition of the state with all these private contractors here would destroy any movement. Exactly. That's 90. Well, okay. I, I probably throw out a random percentage every time, but that's a pretty high percentage of why I became a Marxist Leninist. Hmm. It's not that I don't agree with anarchism. I mean, hmm. ultimately the end goal is the same as I say every fucking time we do this stream. Um, but yeah, I mean, just the straight up abolition of the state as opposed to smashing it, turning it upside down. Or, you know, to put it in computer terminology, turn it off and turn it back on again. Uh, yeah, with the private contractors or, you know, don't, let's not even try to forget the FBI, the CIA, the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, all of those fucking alphabet men. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on top of the private contractors and, uh, you know, mercenaries and armed right wing militia groups. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely see that. And and the way Kropotkin uh, thought of that sort of thing was was investing the revolution in everybody. Um, and I think that applies to the, the next comments by Wade as well. Um, the the idea is in his mind that it, it's not so much that people are benevolent or, or whatever. It's that by for the first time um, having a say in your life, both in 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 uh, your workplace as well as in, in your private life, having that stability, to, that platform to stand on, that, that stable shelter and food and all that, that different things, investing the revolution in the people is going to make everyone a guard of the revolution, um, or at least the majority, the, the vast majority of people, because right now the vast majority of people don't really own anything, don't really have any say in their day-to-day -day lives. They, they, they are at the mercy of others. So flipping that around, uh, because people would then have something they never did before, every single person just naturally, of course, is going to want to defend that new one position. So, so that's how Kropotkin um, conceived of it, as, as just investing it in the people itself. 
and so that's why he didn't also see the need for a, a centralized state. But I, I definitely see the arguments both ways. I think both sides have, have some good points. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, honestly, I want to... Uh, I think the next anarchist piece that we might do might end up being Kropotkin as well, but it, obviously it's not going to be Conquest of Bread because you did that already, but... Yeah, I, I definitely want to do uh, Mutual Aid, uh, yes. a factor of evolution. I think that would be a great one to do. Yeah, um, I have the hardcover academic version at home. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Uh, most of my revolutionary theory came from Haymarket books. Uh, they're always running sales. I mean, I usually don't, you know, come on here and like say, hey, buy from this fucking company. But mm -hmm. like, it's pretty much all leftist, whether it's theory or commentary. Um, yeah. I mean, come on. Haymarket books, the Haymarket riots. It's yeah. kind of easy to put together there. <laughs> yeah, they're really good. They have a great YouTube channel as well. They, they hold like Zoom discussions about a lot of different things. Um, so that's definitely one to check out. Another great uh, bookseller that is a worker-owned cooperative as well is Red Emma's, and they sell a lot of, of stuff from the, the classical theory to the more contemporary stuff. So that's another one to check out, Red Emma's. Red Emma's, that is. Okay. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, back to the text. New section, Controversy with the Anarchists. This controversy took place in 1873. Marx and Engels contributed articles against the Proudhonists, Autonomists, or Anti-Authoritarians to an Italian Socialist Annual, and it was not until 1913 that these articles appeared in German in Neue Zeit. Quote, If the political struggle of the working classes assumes revolutionary form, wrote Marx, ridiculing the anarchists for their repudiation of politics, and if the workers set up their revolutionary dictatorship in place of the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. They commit the terrible crime of violating principles, for in order to satisfy their wretched, vulgar, everyday needs, and to crush the resistance of the bourgeoisie, they give the state a revolutionary and transient form instead of laying down their arms and abolishing the state." Unquote. It was solely against this kind of abolition of the state that Marx fought in refuting the anarchists. He did not at all oppose the view that the state would disappear when classes disappeared, or that it would be abolished when classes were abolished. What he did oppose was the proposition that the workers should renounce the use of arms, organized violence, that is, the state, which is to serve to, quote, crush the resistance of the bourgeoisie. To prevent the true meaning of the struggle against anarchism from being distorted, Marx expressly emphasized the revolutionary and transient form of the state which the proletariat needs. The proletariat needs the state only temporarily. We do not, after all, differ with the anarchists on the question of the abolition of the state as the aim. We maintain that to achieve this aim, we must temporarily make use of the instruments, resources, and methods of state power against the exploiters just as the temporary dictatorship of the oppressed class is necessary for the abolition of classes. Marx chooses the sharpest and clearest way of stating his case against the anarchists. After overthrowing the yoke of the capitalists, should the workers, quote, lay down their arms, or use them against the capitalists in order to crush their resistance? I felt like that was a... A uh, pretty good spot to pause it there, mm -hmm. because that's that's a big part of what we're talking about. Um, yeah. I, I mean, essentially, what Lenin is advocating for here is using the state to crush the capitalist resistance. I right. mean, history shows us over and over that any time that there's a proletarian movement, let alone an actual successful revolution, that capital is going to try to protect itself. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think it's important to, to reemphasize here that when he talks about the state, it's an, an inversion of the bourgeois state. Instead of a state that is there to defend capital and capitalists, it is a state that is there to defend the people, because it is the people. It's made up of the people, and it's controlled by the people um, against the capital uh, interests and, and the capitalists. Um, so, yeah. Um. 
<laughs> Joy said, do audiobooks, damn it, readings for losers with a laughing face. Yeah. I wish there was a really good source. of. I mean, there are some good sources for, for older audiobooks, uh, like the one we're doing right now, Socialism for All. There's Audible Anarchist. There's Audible Socialist. Um, and occasionally they'll do a more modern text. I, I did a couple of David Graeber ones not too long ago. But other than that, it's really hard to find a non-Amazon source of audiobooks um, yeah. that yeah, covers this stuff. So if anyone knows any sources, I, I would love to know. Because I, I read audiobooks all the time. Like doing landscaping, I have a lot of time where uh, just my hands are occupied and, and I love to read audiobooks. I mean, honestly, well, not so much of this job because, well, I mean, I'm not going to go into that. But at my last job, I was listening to Rev Left Radio at work like all go. day, every day. Yeah. I started at the beginning and made it up until uh, 2020 anyway. And now I mean, wow. I'm That's... still I'm still a little like through the end of 2020. Like, yeah, like the fucking well, like the election. <laughs> uh huh. Um. Anarchist Library does have some audio books. I wish oh, yeah. I wish that their library was a little easier to navigate. I totally agree. <laughs> I totally agree. Uh, what, basically, what I've found is that for any title you're looking for, you basically just got to do a Google search, and then it'll bring you to the correct one. Because um, they're very specific about how you have to type in that title or the author or whatever. Um, and nine times out of ten, you're just not going to find what you're looking for searching within their site. Um, Joy also said, crush hard, Lennon Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did want to bring up one more thing. Uh, this, this section here, he's, he's uh, expressing um, opposition to, to what the Prudonists are, are talking about. Now, Proudhon was, was basically the father of, of anarchy. Uh, he was very early on. Um, he's what... Uh, like in the current form, uh, mutualists, not is it mutualists? Yeah, I think it's mutualists. It's it's the uh, the orange and black anarchy symbol. Okay. Um, so they have some interesting ideas about um, you know uh, property being the the the, the ways we we should uh, conceive of who owns something is by who's using it. Um, they had some other interesting ideas too. I've only read one of Prudhon's books and it was, it was on property and it's a really good book, although it's very dry and academic, but he just goes through step by step and lays out why the bourgeois conception of property is, is illegitimate, no matter how much paper and, and history and tradition they put behind it. Any piece of property, uh, especially with, with, with capitalists, um, you go back far enough, enough generations, and you find it's either been stolen or, or you know, pressured away from the people that had it. Uh, so there's some great crime that, that has led to them now having that property. So therefore, it is illegitimate to say that, oh, I own this title. I, you know, it's been in my family for others. Yeah, okay. But at some point, you, you know, your great, great, great whatever conquered this land and just took it. So... Yeah, and that's that's why we need to talk about decolon uh, decolonization if we're gonna have a serious proletarian revolution in North America at all. Indigenous and Black voices have to be prominent in that revolution. Um, the genocide of one and the enslavement of another is precisely what this empire was founded on. Yeah. Oh, um, undoubtedly. The, the entire expansion westward was just one big literal land grab. And it's not as though that was unoccupied land. It was, it was at one point native land. And then I mean, you get into the Indian Removal Act uh, and Andrew Jackson, probably the worst president we've ever had, um, completely ruthless and racist, didn't care at all, instituted the Trail of Tears. Uh, yeah, our entire country was... was stolen and swindled from a lot of people um yeah I'm, I'm getting some some comments in my chat right now uh recommending audible anarchist on youtube yeah that that's definitely a great resource yeah that's what we're using for our uh, emma goldman series nice very good they they do a good job they do they do and they they try to make it it's not like read in a monotone it's not like mm -hmm. 
That's my issue with like Audible. Was it Audible Socialist? I think. I think it was one of their older videos anyway. But like yeah. some of some of the stuff on YouTube is like literally a computer reading it. Yeah. It's just so dry. Right. <laughs> oh my god. I, I mean, like if if there's no other version of that, then then maybe you can get by. But it definitely is yeah. nice to to hear a really good reader reading it. Um, yeah. And uh, Wade Wade mentioned I would happily read text. I've got a voice. I mean, honestly, dude, if you want to do cool. that, like, do that. You should. Yeah. Um. I just thought of another one too. Uh, LibriVox. Uh, it's like this independent audiobook um, app. Basically, they also have a, a website, a website and stuff. Um, but they're the ones who collaborated with Audible Anarchist to, to get all that text out there. So that's another one. And it's it's okay. free for a whole bunch of their stuff. Some of the stuff is pay for. Uh, but at least you're not supporting Amazon at that point. Um, but they also they also take volunteers as well. So so if you're interested in doing reading audiobooks, um, and it's I mean, I would say it's not easy. I, I've I've tried reading live on stream, and I just man, so many stumbles and and mis mispronunciations and. Um, oh but, yeah, uh, and I mean, I'm guilty of that too. When we were yeah. when we were doing the reading, especially if it was one of those situations where Trisha and I were recording it at like fucking midnight, you know, we're all like yawning and <laughs> stumbling through sentences. You know, it, it happens. Um, Wade yeah. said. Unquestionably so. Without our comrades of systemic oppression, there is no revolution, and that's exactly that's worded better than I worded it. But that's the uh, the thought that I was trying to portray there. You got any more uh, comments on your feed, or oh, that's it. That's it so far. So thanks, thanks, John, for putting that that link to the anarchist library. I think I saw. Yep, you put yep, one for and, uh, Red Emma's. Red Emma's. Yep. So those, yeah, those are two great resources. And then LibriVox, it's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X, means free voice. Um, I think Hold it's a on, dot. Let me, put, let me put that in the chat. What was it? LibriVox, L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X. Dot uh, org? Yes. I think, I'm pretty sure it's a dot org. Well, that's what I put, so hopefully it's right. And that will, that link, uh, when I do this through Restream, It'll uh, post it in the comments on YouTube, on Twitch, on Periscope, which is Twitter, and on Facebook. So no matter where you're watching it, you should get these links. If you're listening to it in podcast platforms later, I'll try to remember to go in and add these links. Nice. Yeah, I, I just checked. It is a .org, so th I think that's the right address. I guess I could click it and find out. Oh, wait. No, I can't. That'll show it. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. I tried. All right. Anyway, I guess uh, back to the text. Oh, so I got one more, one more comment just now. Okay. L Libri books is it, is that is that a different one from LibriVox? Uh, but it's a com computer voice. I haven't heard of that one. I'll have to check that one out too. Thanks for the the tip, Moose Lander, aka H Cap Stock. All right. Thank you. All right. Yeah, we can continue on. Moving on. <laughs> but what is the systematic use of arms by any class against another, if not a transient form of a state? That, that is a really good point, actually. That's, like, I, That's a good point. I had never really considered that. Maybe I paused this one line too early. Um, I'm going to read that again. But what is the systematic use of arms by one class against another, if not a transient form of the state? I had never considered that. But I mean, essentially, <laughs> I guess if the masses are come together, coming together to defend the masses, that would be a form of a state, even if it's not a form of a state that would be recognized by, you know. Yeah, yeah, very good. And, and if... Proudhon and, and his his uh, uh, compatriots are actually advocating for disarmament after the current state is overthrown. That that would be something that I would disagree with. I don't think that's wise. There's always going to be counter revolutionaries, uh, especially at the beginning, especially when they still are, you know, clinging to power and and their their followers are are hoping that you know if they still serve them, they can have a, a favored place in the in the new order. Um, and as long as there is a U.S. 
empire around. Uh, yeah, you can't just you can't just throw down your arms. I'm typing out that couple of lines. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, cool. I, I uh, put in my chat. Can someone make a meme of this quote? And it's that last part we just read. Marx chooses the sharpest and clearest way through, you know, the line about the transient form of the state. But I guess I'll just uh, put the video back up and do this in the background rather than eat up airtime. <laughs> Let every social Democrat ask himself, is that how he has been posing the question of the state in controversy with the anarchists? Is that how it has been posed by the vast majority of the official socialist parties of the Second International? Engels expounds the same ideas in much greater detail and still more popularly. First of all, he ridicules the muddled ideas of the Proudhonists, who call themselves anti-authoritarians, i.e. repudiated all authority, all subordination, all power. Take a factory, a railway, a ship on the high seas, said Engels. Is it not clear that not one of these complex technical establishments, based on the use of machinery and the systematic cooperation of many people, could function without a certain amount of subordination and, consequently, without a certain amount of authority or power. Quote, When I counter the most rabid anti-authoritarians with these arguments, the only answer they can give me is the following. Oh, that's true, except that here it is not a question of authority with which we vest our delegates, but of a commission. These people imagine they can change a thing by changing its name. Unquote. Having thus shown that authority and autonomy are relative terms, that the sphere of their application varies with the various phases of social development, that it is absurd to take them as absolutes, and adding that the sphere of application of machinery and large-scale production is steadily expanding. Engels passes from the general discussion of authority to the question of the state. Quote, Had the autonomists, he wrote, contented themselves with saying that the social organization of the future would allow authority only within the bounds which the conditions of production make inevitable. One could have come to terms with them, but they are blind to all facts that make authority necessary, and they passionately fight the word. Why do the anti-authoritarians not confine themselves to crying out against political authority, the state? All socialists are agreed that the state, and with it political authority, will disappear as a result of the coming social revolution, that is, that public functions will lose their political character and become mere administrative functions of watching over social interests. But the anti-authoritarians demand that the political state be abolished at one stroke, even before the social relations that gave birth to it have been destroyed. They demand that the first act of the social revolution shall be the abolition of authority. Have these gentlemen ever seen a revolution? A revolution is certainly the most authoritarian thing there is. It is an act whereby one part of the population imposes its will upon the other part by means of rifles, bayonets, and cannon, all of which are highly authoritarian means. And um, so I actually want to pull up Mao's quote on the same thing um, because, well, obviously he was very influenced by Engels, but I think he further, further refined it. Okay. Give me two seconds. I'm sorry. <laughs> sure. I'll, I'll read a couple comments while you're, while you're doing that then. Okay. Uh, so we have some more recommendations for audiobook sources. Audiobook Buzz, but but the commenter thinks that might be part of LibriVox as well. Um, and then they, they give a quote by Rousseau. Uh, when the people shall have no more to eat, they will eat the rich. <laughs> Amen like to a, that. Yeah, there's like a the opposite of let them eat cake sort of statement. I love it. Um, and then Radical Audiobooks on YouTube is another one. That's not one I've heard of, so thank you for that as well. I may have seen it, but I don't think I've um, listened to any other stuff yet. Cool. So Mao Zedong uh, further elaborated um, on that, essentially saying, Revolution is not a dinner party. It is not an essay or a painting or a piece of embroidery. It cannot be advanced softly, gradually, carefully, considerately, respectfully, politely, plainly, and modestly. A revolution is a violent act in which one class overthrows another class. 
you know, so like they're not trying to romanticize the violence. They're trying to be realistic about it, um, which I mean, I think as time goes on, we can we can see more ways that nonviolence can have an effect. Um, but I mean, coming out of Russia in 1919, there was no way it wasn't going to be bloody. Yeah. Yeah. And and. As we often mention, it's important to keep in mind that, that every day, capital and capitalists do violence to everybody. Um, they, they loot everybody just through their, their, um, just through their power structure that they've set up. Uh, they, they cause people to um, die in, in many different ways, uh, especially for uh, the production of, of cheap products overseas and stuff like that. So... The idea that that somehow a, a bloody revolution um, is just distasteful. Well, I mean, there's violence being done to everyone every day through the current system. Um, yeah. And if you don't believe that, find a person of color or even a even a even a woman and ask what their experience is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, it's a system in, of, of enforced and reinforced hierarchy. And, uh, it's one that rewards people that are, are ruthless and, and willing to do anything in the name of profit. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a benevolent system by any stretch. I'm not quite sure why Joy sent me this in Messenger right now, but <laughs> let the oh well, I guess the reflection's doing it. There we go. Let the sharpest lead. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm sure I'm probably gonna get context in about thirty seconds, but in the meantime, <laughs> back to the text. Uh, I just had a couple more comments coming in. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so Moose Lander says, I now put the Rousseau quote in every chat uh, after I stumbled on some young people debating eat the rich as, as cannibalism. Okay, yeah. It, it, it's a meme. It, it doesn't literally mean eat the rich, and I, I would think people would understand that, but, you know, some people are dense. <laughs> I'm in the... And then Strin says, uh, there are 11 people per minute dying of hunger around the world. And yeah, a lot of that is due to... to artificial West scarcity. Artificial scarcity and, and, and Western imperialism. And I mean, if the capitalists really had their way, there would be no safety net at all. The government would only be there to enforce contract law and to protect private property. Uh, and that would be it. So people literally would start starving in the streets again. So... Capitalism is, is great for only a, that, that upper pinnacle, um, but nobody else. To put it in Occupy's terms, the, the 1% are going to remain comfortable. The 99% are not. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Wade said I should probably mention that I was trying to be funny about the literal thing because uh, – Earlier, he said, I'll probably forgo the literal can cannibalism, but figuratively, <laughs> yum, yum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Take their power, you know. Take, take the, the power that they've hoarded by, by stealing it from everyone else, just by their lottery of birth um, yeah. or their fortunate connections that they've made along the way. Um, Strin also says, let's see. Uh, I just heard Vijay Prashad today say that there was 1 billion people on the planet without shoes. Without shoes. Uh, and uh, pretty random stats, but clearly we have living in very violent conditions. Yeah. Don't even have shoes. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what was that about? Efficiency and, and uh, you know lifting so many people out of poverty that capitalism is always talking about no better system for that and all that that jazz seems to be leaving a lot of people behind yeah yep all right moving on and the victorious party must maintain its rule 
by means of the terror which its arms inspire in the reactionaries. Would the Paris Commune have lasted more than a day if it had not used the authority of the armed people against the bourgeoisie? Cannot we, on the contrary, blame it for having made too little use of that authority? Therefore, one of two things, either that anti-authoritarians don't know what they're talking about, in which case they're creating nothing but confusion, or they do know, and in that case they're betraying the cause of the proletariat. In either case, they serve only reaction." Unquote. This argument touches upon questions which should be examined in connection with the relationship between politics and economics during the withering away of the state. The next chapter is devoted to this. These questions are the transformation of public functions from political into simple functions of administration and the political state. This last term, one particularly liable to misunderstanding, indicates the process of the withering away of the state. At a certain stage of this process, the state which is withering away may be called a non-political state. Again, the most remarkable thing in this argument of Engels is the way he states his case against the anarchists. Social Democrats, claiming to be disciples of Engels, have argued on this subject against the anarchists millions of times since 1873, but they have not argued as Marxists could and should. The anarchist idea of abolition of the state is muddled and non-revolutionary. That is how Engels put it. It is precisely the revolution in its rise and development, with its specific tasks in relation to violence, authority, power, the state, that the anarchists refuse to see. The usual criticism of anarchism by present-day social democrats has boiled down to the purest Philistine banality, quote, we recognize the state, whereas the anarchists do not. Naturally, such banality cannot but repel workers who are at all capable of thinking and revolutionary-minded. What Engels says is different. He stresses that all socialists recognize that the state will disappear as a result of the socialist revolution. He then deals specifically with the question of the revolution, the very question which, as a rule, the social democrats evade out of opportunism, leaving it, so to speak, exclusively for the anarchists, quote, to work out. And when dealing with this question, Engels takes the bull by the horns. He asks, should not the commune have made more use of the revolutionary power of the state, that is, of the proletariat, armed and organized as the ruling class? Well, that's the question, really, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, I just lost my spot, son of a bitch. I wanted to quote that line. Oh, yeah, right here. And when dealing with this questions, or with this question, Ingalls takes the bull by the horns, he asks, should not the commune have made more use of the revolutionary power of the state, that is, of the proletariat armed and organized as the ruling class? And I said on part two or part three, maybe, I think it was part two, um, th- that's kind of how I felt about it. Had they been more forceful, it wouldn't have been... Yeah, it, they, they, it, they wouldn't have been overwhelmed. Right. Yeah. Yep. And, yeah. That's, that's and, all and, I had there. Yeah, and and what Kropotkin was was saying about that in the Conquest of Bread was that had they instead of you know bickering about who's going to be on what committee and and you know what bureaucracy was going to be set up, had they instead tried to fulfill the promises of the revolution, then every single person in in Paris would be uh, a revolutionary, and they would have just naturally resisted any sort of kind of. Uh, conquest from outside but but he too didn't say that they should give up their arms so um i'm not quite sure where the the, the criticism of, of giving up arms and, and throwing away all the 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 former power comes from because uh, it's it's not something that it's not something that i would agree with and i wouldn't think that i wouldn't think that most anarchists today would would agree with that either i think they see the need for yeah for guarding the their gains yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, um, I think that as we pointed out in the last stream, what it really all comes down to is centralized versus decentralized. It's not even really about the role of the state if yeah. we're going with Lenin's definition of the state. Right. Right. Um, and yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, there's still going to be uh, 
organization. It's just that like Kropotkin thought it was just going to naturally arise. People that, that are interested in a certain thing are going to get together and, and, you know, make sure the people are provided for in that thing, whether it's defense or food or housing or whatever it is. And, and Lenin wants to have it be more of a uh, systematic coordinated approach, which I can see as well. Um, but yeah, th those seem to be the main differences. Um, before I go back to the text, I just wanted to read John's comment here. Capitalism causes poverty and destruction of cultures. Yep. Yep. Absolutely does. Uh, okay, yeah. I lied. What, one more comment because we <laughs> just commented this. Arms are like Pandora's box. It's open. There's no putting it back. True. Well said. True. True. Um, it's yeah. I mean, it's just an unfortunate reality that that there would be people that would mean to do a revolution harm and and put things back to way the way that it was, um, and they're not just going to be resisted through polite conversation. Um, it really sucks. Like it would be great if people could work out the differences a little better. Um, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? But when it's when it's uh, having a state for the people that they actually control versus what we have now, uh, if if the only way to hold on to that sort of thing would be through armed resistance, then that's what you got to do. Um, but it, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily come to uh, any sort of violent action as long as you can have a show of force and saying, hey, we're not just going to roll over and let you come back into our, our town and, and take over again. That might be enough, depending on how big and, and determined the, the opponents are. That's certainly what happened in the, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina when mutual aid disaster relief went out and, and helped the people there that had been completely abandoned by the, the local government, left to fend for themselves, and were being harassed and, and shot at. I think maybe uh, a few of them were even killed uh, in the streets by these, these roving bands of... Uh, of white supremacists, of, of I guess basically KKK members, uh, until uh, uh, mutual aid disaster relief showed up with guns and just made a show of things. There was never a shootout. They just had to make it clear that they were not going to let them continue the reign of terror. And the same was true with the the uh, I want to get their name right. I think it's the the deacons for self defense. Um, who were, were part of the civil rights era in the United States, who, when uh, the KKK would go on their, their night rides and terrorize black families by shooting up their homes, the Deacons for self def I, I don't think that's the right name, but it's something like the Deacons for Self-Defense. Um, there's some great podcast episodes about it out there and some great documentaries. Uh, they just made a show of arms, and, and it, it did never come to, to blows or anything. But just by making that show of arms, that they managed to push back the KKK as well. Uh, so yeah, I mean, ide ideally that's what happens. But at, at least you have the option to use more force if need be. Well, yeah, I mean, ultimately, I guess what it comes down to for me is I would rather have the option and never need it right. than need it and never have the option. Right. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, back to the text, I suppose. Back to the text. Prevailing official social democracy usually dismissed the question of the concrete tasks of the proletariat in the revolution, either with a philistine sneer or at best with the sophistic evasion the future will show. And the anarchists were justified in saying about such social democrats that they were failing in their task of giving the workers a revolutionary education. Engels draws upon the experience of the last proletarian revolution precisely for the purpose of making a most concrete study of what should be done by the proletariat and in what manner in relation to both the banks and the state. New section, Letter to Babel. One of the most, if not the most, remarkable observation on the state in the works of Marx and Engels is contained in the following passage in Engels' letter to Babel, dated March 18 to 28, 1875. 
This letter, we may observe in parenthesis, was, as far as we know, first published by Babel in the second volume of his memoirs, which appeared in 1911, i.e. 36 years after the letter had been written and sent. Engels wrote to Babel criticizing the same draft of the Gotha program, which Marx criticized in his famous letter to Brock. Referring specially to the question of the state, Engels said, quote, the free people's state has been transferred into the free state. Taken in its grammatical sense, a free state is one where the state is free in relation to its citizens, hence a state with a despotic government. The whole talk about the state should be dropped, especially since the commune, which was no longer a state in the proper sense of the word. The people's state has been thrown in our faces by the anarchists to the point of disgust, although already Marx's book against Proudhon and later the Communist Manifesto say plainly that with the introduction of the socialist order of society, the state dissolves of itself and disappears. As the state is only a transitional institution which is used in the struggle, in the revolution, to hold down one's adversaries by force, it is sheer nonsense to talk of a free people's state. So long as the proletariat still needs the state, it does not need it in the interests of freedom, but in order to hold down its adversaries. And as soon as it becomes possible to speak of freedom, the state as such ceases to exist. We would therefore propose replacing the state everywhere by Gemeinwesen, a good old German word which can very well take the place of the French word commune, unquote. It should be borne in mind that this letter refers to the party could you, could you program, right there which second? Marx criticized in a letter dated only a few weeks later than the above. Marx's letter is dated May 5th, 1875, and that at the time Engels was living with Marx in London. Consequently, when he says we in the last sentence, Engels undoubtedly, in his own as well as in Marx's name, suggests to the leader of the German Workers' Party that the word state be struck out of the program and replaced with the word community. What a howl about anarchism would be raised by the leading lights of present-day Marxism, quote-unquote, which has been falsified for the convenience of the opportunists, if such an amendment of the program were suggested to them. Let them howl. This will... Okay, I, I actually paused that a little bit late, but... Um, <laughs> That's okay. I want to. I don't know if you interrupted, but I, I wasn't paying attention for a second because I, we, I went over to the... Twitch stream manager, I noticed in the dashboard here that uh, I have a, a viewer on Twitch, so I went over to the platform and I found out that we got four new followers today, so thank hey, you. Hey, congrats that's, on that. Yeah, that's awesome. Very cool. Um, so back to that, uh, the, the Deacons for self or for Defense and Justice, that, that's, that was the name that I was, I was struggling for. So the Deacons for De Defense and Justice was founded in 1964 in Jonesboro, Louisiana, to protect civil rights activists from the KKK. The organization was made up of black veterans uh, from World War II who believed in armed self-defense. So thanks for that, Strin. Um, and then I have a potential troll in the chat. We'll see how you do there, bud. Uh, <laughs> whole, the whole USSR thing just was not to be. Uh, when did Lenin die? About 100 years ago? Yup. Got him. <laughs> I don't know what you're trying to prove there. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, the USSR, that, that would be an interesting topic to, to cover sometime is why the USSR fell apart. That um, is such a deep topic. Yep. I mean, yep. if you want to do that as like a cross pollination thing i'm totally I'm down with that definitely be down with that there's a lot of research that goes into that <laughs> yeah um uh, but but for anyway now uh yeah we're, we're talking about the beginning of it and and the theory that went into the revolution that that eventually led to the formation of the ussr uh oh communism sucks well with that solid logic i i, I guess i should just end the stream right now um anyway so why didn't so, i think of that yeah really I just should have known it sucked because, you know, living for the, the benefit of others in the capitalist system and allowing them to take most of the, the value that I produce is so much better. So much better. I, I love this system where I'm beholden to a master, but I get to choose, though. I get to choose my own master. It's like a choose your own adventure, but it's for your life. And it every page, every option sucks. Um, 
Uh, but anyway, so so Marx was was talking about, and I was actually just going to bring this up, like that they shouldn't even be calling the worker state a state. He preferred community, or there was that German word that you talked about, uh, yeah, gemein, Gemeinweisen, Gemeinwesen. I'm going to have to ask my wife about that. She she understands German. But yeah, I totally agree with that. I think we should stop talking about the worker state as a state because it just gets muddled and confused because it is the inversion of our current conception of the state. It is, it, is a, a, it is a government for, of, and by the people in the truest sense that they're talking about, not one that just defends capital and capitalists. Uh, it's one that actively opposes them. So it really needs a different term, I think, and, and community or commune or uh, Gemeinweisen, Gemeinweisen, I think they pronounce the, the W's like V's, right? I believe so. Uh, Wade said, since obviously your guy is um, in your Twitch chat, not in our Facebook chat, but Wade <laughs> said, choose your own adventure, the torture chambers. <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. Pretty pretty gold <laughs> <laughs> i would love to see the cover for that one <laughs> oh, <Damn boy>. it. <laughs> all right <laughs> yeah Is we there, can uh, okay i don't have any more comments so we can continue on if you want sounds good to me earn them the praises of the bourgeoisie and we shall go on with our work in revising the program of our party we must by all means take the advice of Engels and Marx into consideration in order to come nearer to the truth, to restore Marxism by ridding it of distortions, to guide the struggle of the working class for its emancipation more correctly. Um, I just wanted to elaborate. Our party, as he referred to it, is the Bolshevik party. Yeah. I, I feel like most of us probably knew that, but I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Oh, and, and Strin says, offers dictatorship of the proletariat. I just, I find that term is, is too easily used against uh, communists because the, the, the conception, the modern conception in the Western mind of a dictatorship is just an autocrat, is, is uh, you know, someone who gets to, it's a complete authoritarian. And that's not what it's supposed to be, at, at least in theory. Um, so I just, I find that term lacking. And I find it's, it's too easy for people to just shut off their brains once they get to that point. Because, oh, dictatorship, I don't want that sort of thing. Get that out of here. That, that, that totally goes against what I believe in. I want freedom, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's because they don't understand what that means. Right. I always point out that under the same terminology, we already live under a dictatorship. It's just the dictatorship of capital. Of the capital class. The dictatorship class. of the bourgeoisie. Absolutely. Um, John said, human domestication and labor, authoritarian dictatorship, economic sanctions, and a stroke of sanity to not drive us into nuclear war changed Russia. I mean, yeah, there, there's, as I said, there's a whole slew of things that went into it, and Western intervention is at the top of that list. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, just the, the nuclear arms race that... Um the U.S. because they could just take the workers' capital and do whatever they felt like with it and not really care about their people as much. They could take a lot more money and put that into arms and building up the military and stuff like that. And and USSR felt like it needed to keep up because they were, I mean, U.S. was definitely their biggest rival. Uh, so they, they had to put, they probably overextended themselves quite a bit in the, in the military capacity uh which which took away from their goal of of helping the people natalie said thanks some of us are still learning and that that's why we try to put context to this or like you know if there's a liner note that they don't read i I try to read it yeah uh or that they don't mention um but yeah exactly um and then one more wade said quote freedom ain't free to borrow from something we always heard here in Texas. <laughs> well, and, and in a certain sense, that's true. Uh, actual freedom, which is, is the upliftment of, of the common person, does take constant vigilance against people that love hierarchy and, and love 
subjugating others for their own benefit. So that, that definitely is true in that sense. Uh, John replied to Natalie saying, we are all forever learning. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, shoot. <coughs> I, I, I hope I don't present myself as any sort of expert on all this stuff. I'm just a guy who's read a few books and, and has ideas. And that's, that's really about it. I'm learning a lot of this stuff at the same time. Same. Same. All right. Well, uh, back to the text. Did I miss? There we go. Certainly no one opposed to the advice of Engels and Marx will be found among the Bolsheviks. The only difficulty that may perhaps arise will be in regard to the term. In German, there are two words meaning community, of which Engels used the one which does not denote a single community, but their totality, a system of communities. In Russian, there is no such word, and we may have to use the French word commune, although this also has its drawbacks. Quote, the commune was no longer a state in the proper sense of the word, unquote. This is the most theoretically important statement Engels makes. After what has been said above, this statement is perfectly clear. The commune was ceasing to be a state since it had to suppress not the majority of the population, but a minority, the exploiters. It had smashed the bourgeois state machine. In place of a special coercive force, the population itself came on the scene. All this was a departure from the state in the proper sense of the word, and had the commune become firmly established, all traces of the state in it would have withered away of themselves. It would not have had to abolish the institutions of the state, they would have ceased to function as they ceased to have anything to do. Quote, the people's state has been thrown in our faces by the anarchists, unquote. In saying this, Engels, above all, has in mind Bakunin, and his attacks on the German Social Democrats. Engels admits that these attacks were justified insofar as the people's state was as much an absurdity and as much a departure from socialism as the free people's state. Engels tried to put the struggle of the German Social Democrats against the anarchists on the right lines to make this struggle correct in principle, to rid it of opportunist prejudices concerning the state. Unfortunately, Engels' letter was pigeonholed for 36 years. We shall see farther on that, even after this letter was published, Kautsky persisted in virtually the same mistakes against which Engels had warned. Babel replied to Engels in a letter dated September 21st, 1875, in which he wrote, among other things, that he, quote, fully agreed with Engels' opinion of the draft program, and that he had reproached Liebknecht with readiness to make concessions but if we take Babel's pamphlet, Our Aims, we find there views on the state that are absolutely wrong. Quote, the state must be transformed from one based on class rule into a people's state, unquote. This was printed in the ninth, the ninth edition of Babel's pamphlet. It is not surprising that opportunist views on the state, so persistently repeated, were absorbed by the German Social Democrats, especially as Engels' revolutionary interpretations had been safely pigeonholed, and all the conditions of life were such as to wean them from revolution for a long time. Oh. Did something crash there? My bad, I forgot to unmute. Oh, okay. That's all, so all of a sudden, I was, all of a sudden it was dead silence. I was like, uh-oh. My bad. <laughs> My bad, you guys. I was just going to say there's some footnotes here. <clears throat> and um, so, like, the letter uh, was not brought to the SPD members' attention for 36 years. Um, not to say that um, it didn't. I don't know. I, it, it wasn't published, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Hmm. Um, and then Liebknecht was a founder of the Social Democratic Workers' Party of Germany in 1869 and a central leader of the German Social Democratic Party, or the SPD, uh, when it was formed in 1875 by a merger of Liebknecht's organization with the Lasallian General German Workers' Association. Um 
Where is 14? Oh, um, there is no English translation for Babel's pamphlet, uh, pamphlet Our mm. Aims. Okay. Uh, and then finally, um, this is for the last line that it read, to wean them from revolution for a long time. Uh, the footnote is, that is after 1871, although there was political... Uh, there was political despite repression. There were relatively few strikes and no uprisings like those in 1848 or afterwards as in France. See hmm. the introduction for more on this. That's all. Okay. So uh, we will be moving on to section four. Um, criticism of the draft of the Erfurt program. Cool. Um there's a couple comments in our chat, too. Um, I'm not going to go ahead and read them all, but uh, I'm glad that you guys are all having this discussion right now. Yeah. Enjoy. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you're referring to there. Uh, in, in, in my chat, they, they were recently discussing the, the best wine pairing with uh, eating the rich. So oh. that's, that's been fun oh. to see that play out as well. <laughs> oh man <laughs> anyway into uh, section 4 if you don't have anything else to no no we can move on okay section 2 criticism of the draft of the Erfurt program in analyzing Marxist teachings on the state the criticism of the draft of the Erfurt program sent by Engels to Kautsky on June 29 1891 and published only 10 years later in Neue Zeit, cannot be ignored, for it is with the opportunist views of the Social Democrats on questions of state organization that this criticism is mainly concerned. We shall note in passing that Engels also makes an exceedingly valuable observation on economic questions, which shows how attentively and thoughtfully he watched the various changes occurring in modern capitalism, and how for this reason he was able to foresee, to a certain extent, the tasks of our present, the imperialist, epic. Here is that observation, referring to the word planlessness used in the draft program. As characteristic of capitalism, Engels wrote, quote, when we pass from joint stock companies to trusts which assume control over and monopolize whole industries, it is not only private production that ceases, but also planlessness, unquote. Here we have what is most essential in the theoretical appraisal of the latest stage of capitalism, i.e. imperialism, namely that capitalism becomes monopoly capitalism. The latter must be emphasized because the erroneous bourgeois reformist assertion that monopoly capitalism or state monopoly capitalism is no longer capitalism but can now be called state socialism and so on is very common. The trusts, of course, never provided, do not now provide, and cannot provide complete planning. But however much they do plan, however much the capitalist magnates calculate in advance the volume of production on a national and even on an international scale, and however much they systematically regulate it, we still remain under capitalism. At its new stage, it is true, but still capitalism without a doubt. The proximity of such capitalism to socialism should serve genuine representatives of the proletariat as an argument proving the proximity, facility, feasibility, and urgency of the socialist revolution, and not at all as an argument for tolerating the repudiation of such a revolution, and the efforts to make capitalism look more attractive, something which all reformists are trying to do. But to return to the question of the state, in his letter, Engels makes three particularly valuable suggestions. First, in regard to the republic, Second, in regard to the connection between the national question and state organization. And third, in regard to local self-government. In regard to the Republic, Engels made this the focal point of this criticism of the draft of the Erfurt program. And when we recall the importance which the Erfurt program acquired for all the social democrats of the world, and that it became the model for the whole Second International, we may say without exaggeration that Engels thereby criticizes the opportunism of the whole Second International. Quote, the political demands of the draft, Engels wrote, have one great fault. It lacks, 
Engels' emphasis, precisely what should have been said, unquote. And later on, he makes it clear that the German constitution is, strictly speaking, a copy of the extremely reactionary constitution of 1850, that the Reichstag is only, as Wilhelm Liebknecht put it, the fig leaf of absolutism, and that to wish, quote, to transform all the instruments of labor into common property on the basis of a constitution which legalizes the existence of petty states and the federation of petty German states is a, quote, obvious absurdity. Quote, to touch on that is dangerous, however, Engels added, knowing only too well that it was impossible legally to include in the program the demand for a republic in Germany. But he refused to merely accept this obvious consideration, which satisfied, quote, everybody. He continued, quote, Nevertheless, somehow or other, the thing has to be attacked. How necessary this is is shown precisely at the present time by opportunism, which is gaining ground in a large section of the social democrat press. Fearing a renewal of the anti-socialist law, or recalling all manner of over-hasty pronouncements made during the reign of that law. They now want the party to find the present legal order in Germany adequate for putting through all party demands by peaceful means." Unquote. Engels particularly stressed the fundamental fact that the German Social Democrats were prompted by fear of a renewal of the anti-socialist law, and explicitly described it as opportunism. He declared that Precisely because there was no republic and no freedom in Germany, the dreams of a, quote, peaceful path were perfectly absurd. Engels was careful not to tie his hands. He admitted that in republican or very free countries, quote, one can conceive, only conceive, of a peaceful development towards socialism. But in Germany, he repeated, quote, in Germany, where the government is almost omnipotent and the Reichstag and all other representative bodies have no real power. To advocate such a thing in Germany, where, moreover, there is no need to do so, means removing the fig leaf from absolutism and becoming oneself a screen for its nakedness." Uh, The footnote is, here Engels is concerned that SPD leaders are not only trying to avoid provoking new repressive legislation, but are also arguing that socialism could come to Germany through even the reactionary forms of the Prussian government. Hmm. Um, And for the the last quote, uh, there was also one that I didn't pause it for, but the anti-socialist laws enforced between 1878 and 1890 were directed against the SPD and union, union organizing and included press censorship and limits on the right to assemble. Many SPD leaders served time in prison for violating these laws. That's pretty wild. Yeah. For well, sure. Um, anyway. So, so I had a couple of uh, comments here in, in my okay. chat. Um, uh, libertarians love talking about crony capitalism and, and that that does remind me a lot of what they were talking about before, how the capitalists are like, oh no, that's monopoly capitalism. That's not real capitalism anymore. Um, their, their terrible arguments have, haven't really changed. But, but we see every time that there's less regulation, it always moves towards monopoly uh, with, with capitalism, that is to say. Because why wouldn't it? Uh, especially if you're not even regulated against like unfair business practices, once you retain a certain size, all you got to do, like, like say you're a Walmart, imagine Walmart without any sort of regulation. All you'd have to do is roll into a town, drop your prices to, to, I mean, you could lose money. They could be like negative prices until all of your competition goes out of business. And then you just jack them back up even higher than, than they were before to start with. And, it has nothing to do with how good the ideas of the other businesses are. It has nothing to do, to do with, with you inherently being a better business person. It's just you are using your size to become the only kid on the block. And without regulation, that would happen all the time. It does happen all the time. That, that's how come we came to things like the robber baron era. Um, and without regulation, it leads to child exploitation. Uh, yeah, they can they can cry all they want how that's just crony capitalism or not, you know, or it's a um, 
you know, what, what do they call it? The, the monopoly capitalism. But that, that's the way capitalism goes. It's, it's a sucking up of all the power until there's, there's only like one or two left standing in, in every particular field. Yeah, neo feudalism. That's a good way of putting it. Uh, Moose uh, Lander. Uh, John said, and moves towards a police state. Um, yeah. So Lenin kind of called the called imperialism the the highest stage of capitalism. Um, God damn it! Who was the guy that said? That fascism is capitalism and decay. Why am I drawing a blank on that? Uh, I know I've heard that I've, I've heard that that phraseology before, so I'm definitely familiar with that saying. Yeah, but ultimately, exactly, it does move towards a police state because we're sliding into fascism. As capitalism breaks down, it tries to defend itself. Yeah. Yeah, uh, my own my only problem with that sort of statement is that it it means that you unless you have those particular conditions, then you kind of give a pass to anything else that I would also call fascism. Like I would call the the alt right and uh, the neo Nazi movements and all that sort of thing. I would say those are fascistic, even though. Oh yeah, but I mean, is their existence not a sign of the decaying of capitalism? Right, right. They definitely can go hand in hand. It's just like when, once you get to the point where you're defining fascism as, as like you got to check off all these boxes. That's one reason that, that I, I think That's like uh, Umberto Eco, well, I, I feel it's really useful, his, his, his list of things that, that are common to all of when he, when he talks about er fascism. Um, I think that's useful, but then there's the danger that you can be like, oh, well, it doesn't check all the boxes, so it must not be fascism. We don't have anything to worry about. And I mean, and neo-fascism might not check all the boxes, but it sure as shit is still fascism. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> I mean. and that's the thing. Is uh, I mean, and fascism, by its very nature, is always trying to conceal itself. There's a reason yeah. that the, 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 the Klan wears hoods. There's a reason that you know, Nazis are always uh, changing their rhetoric and, the, and the, the, the terms they use to try to get around things is because if you just put it out there, people are just revolted by it. And uh, so you have to sneak it in very slowly. Um, and, and also, it also it has the tendency to just superficially adopt any sort of ideology as long as it moves it towards a, a, a greater center of power. So it can, it can shape shift and seem like a lot of different things, but when it comes down to it, it it's, it's all about just enforcing a certain order where, I mean, it, it, it's like capitalism. It, it is very much like capitalism to the extreme. It's yeah. where you'd be like capitalism, but only white men can be on the top. And there's absolutely no legal way that anyone else can be. Um, that would be like what fascism would be. So That's fair. Uh, Wade said, fish stick sounds like a great thing to call fascist. I, I think that he's referring to when you said fascistic. Fascistic. <laughs> yes. fish Don't mistake stick. that for fish sticks. Fascistic. And hopefully your, your fish sticks are not fascistic. Send them back if, <laughs> if you notice that. <laughs> that was good. That was good. That was good. <laughs> anyway. Uh, back to the text, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, let's keep going. All right. The great majority of the official leaders of the German Social Democratic Party, which pigeonholed this advice, have really proved to be a screen for absolutism. Quote, In the long run, such a policy can only lead one's own party astray. They push general, abstract political questions into the foreground, thereby concealing the immediate concrete questions, which, at the moment of the first great events, the first political crisis, automatically pose themselves. What can result from this, except that, at the decisive moment, the party suddenly proves helpless, and that uncertainty and discord on the most decisive issues reign in it because these issues have never been discussed? Quote, This forgetting of the great, the principal considerations, for the momentary interests of the day, this struggling and striving for the success of the moment, regardless of later consequences, the sacrifice of the future of the movement for its present, 
may be honestly meant, but it is and remains opportunism, and honest opportunism is perhaps the most dangerous of all. If one thing is certain, it is that our party and the working class can only come to power in the form of the Democratic Republic. This is even the specific form for the dictatorship of the proletariat, as the great French Revolution has already shown." Unquote. Engels realized here, in a particularly striking form, the fundamental idea which runs through all of Marx's works, namely that the Democratic Republic is the nearest approach to the dictatorship of the proletariat. For such a republic, without in the least abolishing the rule of capital, and therefore the oppression of the masses and the class struggle, inevitably leads to such an extension, development, unfolding, and intensification of this struggle that, as soon as it becomes possible to meet the fundamental interests of the oppressed masses, this possibility is realized inevitably and solely through the dictatorship of the proletariat, through the leadership of those masses by the proletariat. These two are, quote, forgotten words of Marxism for the whole of the Second International, and the fact that they have been forgotten was demonstrated with particular vividness by the history of the Menshevik Party during the first six months of the Russian Revolution of 1917. On the subject of a federal republic, in connection with the national composition of the population, Engels wrote, quote, What should take the place of the present-day Germany, with its reactionary monarchical constitution and its equally reactionary division into petty states, a division which perpetuates all the specific features of Prussianism instead of dissolving them in Germany as a whole? In my view, the proletariat can only use the form of the one and indivisible republic. In the gigantic territory of the United States, a federal republic is still, on the whole, a necessity, although in the eastern states it is already becoming a hindrance. It would be a step forward in Britain, where the two islands are peopled by four nations, and in spite of a single parliament, three different systems of legislation already exist side by side. In little Switzerland, it has long been a hindrance, tolerable only because Switzerland is content to be a purely passive member of the European state system. For Germany, federalization on the Swiss model would be an enormous step backwards. Two points distinguish a union state from a completely unified state. First, that each member state, each canton, has its own civil and criminal legislative and judicial system. And second, that alongside a popular chamber, there is also a federal chamber in which each canton, whether large or small, votes as such. In Germany, the Union state is the transition to the completely unified state, and the revolution from above of 1866 and 1870 must not be reversed, but supplemented by a movement from below." Unquote. Far from being indifferent to the forms of state, Engels, on the contrary, tried to analyze the transitional forms with the utmost thoroughness in order to establish, in accordance with the concrete historical peculiarities of each particular case, from what and to what the given transitional form is passing. Approaching the matter from the standpoint of the proletariat and the proletarian revolution, Engels, like Marx, upheld democratic centralism, the republic, one and indivisible. He regarded the Federal Republic either as an exception and a hindrance to development, or as a transition from a monarchy to a centralized republic, as a step forward under certain special conditions. And among these special conditions, he puts the national question to the fore. Although mercilessly criticizing the reactionary nature of small states, and the screening of this by the national question in certain concrete cases, Engels, like Marx, never betrayed the slightest desire to brush aside the national question, a desire of which the Dutch and Polish Marxists, who proceed from their perfectly justified opposition to the narrow Philistine nationalism of, quote, their little states, are often guilty. You're muted. Thanks there for you that. Go. You Thanks for that. <laughs> uh, there's a footnote here. Uh, for instance, Rosa Luxemburg argued that socialists should not support Poland's independence from Russian domination on the grounds that only socialism could liberate Poland and that any effort spent fighting for self-determination was a diversion. Hmm. 
Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. There was also a, a footnote that I missed um, where he was talking about uh, not reversing the revolution from above, but supplementing it with a movement from below. Mm-hmm. Here, Ingalls is arguing that a centralized republic, as opposed to a looser federation, would be a positive reform in Germany. This section may be confusing for readers unfamiliar with the history of the long democratic struggle in Europe against feudalism, uh, much like the transition out of capitalism is going to be very difficult Mm -hmm. and will certainly cost lives. The same can certainly be said about the transition from feudalism. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they they described it. I think Marx described it as uh, capitalism emerging, you know, drenched in blood from its struggles against feudalism. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not as though those kings just, you know, went quietly into the night. They, they, they tried to retain power just as much as, as capitalists are, are trying to retain power now. Yeah. Um, he went on, but it is not necessary to completely grasp all of the arguments here to continue reading on to the next section. Liberal radical and socialist thinkers of the 19th century all advocated replacing the old feudal and feuding local uh, principalities dominated by local landed aristocrats with large unified and democratic nations as an important reform, especially in Germany and Italy. See my comment in the notes on the previous chapter about segregation and in the United States and defense of states rights. Um, Obviously, I'm not going back to read the previous notes. But, uh, yeah. Do you have anything you want to add in there? Or? Uh, no, no. I, I, I guess I don't know enough about the, the local history of the time to add too much. Yeah, uh, same. That's, like that's why I always try to read these footnotes, because I don't yeah, really yeah. know the context either. Sure. I, I like Wade's comments there. That foot must be getting full of notes, <laughs> up to ankle notes. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. He also said, it does, but the ideals seem to have been inspirational, at least to some degree. Um, are, are you talking about the transition out of feudalism, or are you talking about um, the national question? Um, anyway, I guess, uh, back to the text again. Uh, do you got well, comments? No. Well, I'm just looking at, I don't think we covered Joy's comment there. Our democratic republic oh, sucks. I missed that. Yeah. And that's, we that's, also... that's true because it is, it is a democratic republic for the service of capital and capitalism, yes. uh, not for the people. Uh, Wade said, come back on that. Was your uh, comment about the ideals being inspirational to some degree? Um, Was that about uh, the national question? Or was that about... What was the other thing? I don't know. I don't know. So, uh, in in my comments here, Mooselander says, "You mean we can't in, uh, we can't one hand it over. We can't one hand it over the, a long weekend, the revolution. We can't do it over one weekend. Yeah, no, it's 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 not going to be. <laughs> this trend says it'll be at least two weekends long. <laughs> yeah. At least, at least, at least. Yeah." Um, I'm also, I, I skimmed ahead a little bit and I'm concerned on whether or not we're going to be able to finish this chapter today. We still have 10 pages to go. Yeah. Um, let's see. What's the next section? A lot closer. <laughs> let's see. Where about we a page. Now? Well, about two pages. Do you want to do page. like, we could just do to the next section. Because okay. yeah, my my wife has threatened me that if I I don't get off by ten, then uh, I'm not going to be happy about that. So <laughs> I got to yeah, make sure. Yeah, don't, don't find yourself in the doghouse. No, definitely don't want to don't want to do that. <coughs> uh, 
Oh, the ideology seems to have been internationally inspiring as well as personally. Yeah. Okay. You're right. You're right. I, I, I'm tracking now. Cool. Um, all right. Yeah. Moving on. Even in regard to Britain. Even in regard to Britain, where geographical conditions, a common language, and the history of many centuries would seem to have put an end to the national question in the various small divisions of the country. Even in regard to that country, Engels reckoned with the plain fact that the national question was not yet a thing of the past, and recognized in consequence that the establishment of a federal republic would be a step forward. Of course, there is not the slightest hint here of Engels abandoning the criticism of the shortcomings of a federal republic, or renouncing the most determined advocacy of and struggle for a unified and centralized democratic republic. But Engels did not at all mean democratic centralism in the bureaucratic sense in which the term is used by bourgeois and petty bourgeois ideologists, the anarchists among the latter. His idea of centralism did not in the least preclude such broad local self-government as would combine the voluntary defense of the unity of the states by the communes and districts, and the complete elimination of all bureaucratic practices and all ordering from above. Carrying forward the program views of Marxism on the state, Engels wrote, quote, So then, a unified republic, but not in the sense of the present French republic, which is nothing but the empire established in 1798 without the emperor. From 1792 to 1798, each French department, each commune, enjoyed complete self-government on the American model, and this is what we too must have, how self-government is to be organized, and how we can manage without a bureaucracy, has been shown to us by America and the First French Republic, and is being shown even today by Australia, Canada, and the other English colonies, and a provincial regional, and communal self-government of this type is far freer than, for instance, Swiss federalism, under which, it is true, the canton is very independent in relation to the Bund, i.e. the federated state as a whole, but is also independent in relation to the district and the commune. The cantonal governments appoint the district governors and prefects, which is unknown in English-speaking countries, and which we want to abolish here as resolutely in the future as the Prussian Landrata and Regierungsrata, commissioners, district police chiefs, governors, and in general, all officials appointed from above. Accordingly, Engels proposes the following words for the self-government clauses in the program, quote, complete self-government for the provinces, gubernias or regions, districts and communes through officials elected by universal suffrage, the abolition of all local and provincial authorities appointed by the state, unquote. I have already had occasion to point out in Pravda No. 68, which was suppressed by the government of Kerensky and other socialist, quote-unquote, ministers, how on this point, of course, not on this point alone by any means, our pseudo-socialist representatives of pseudo-revolutionary pseudo-democracy have made glaring departures from democracy. Naturally, People who have bound themselves by a coalition to the imperialist bourgeoisie have remained deaf to this criticism. Doesn't that sound familiar? <laughs> I was just about to, to say the same thing, yeah. Um, sure does. Looking at the Democratic Party there. Yep. But uh, naturally, I, I just want to reread that line for uh, mm -hmm. effect. Right. Naturally, people who have bound themselves by a, quote, coalition to the imperialist bourgeoisie have remained deaf to this criticism. So I'm looking at the progressive Democrats primarily here. But, uh, yeah. Um, there, is a, there is a note here. Uh, Lenin cited Pravda number 68. He wrote several articles in this issue of Pravda and it is not clear which specific article he is referring to here, although he does refer to the SRs and Mensheviks' refusal to publicly disclaim Russian annexation of oppressed nations and peoples uh, as a result of the war. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's cool. Yeah, I don't have anything else for that. Okay. Um, 
Wade said, I know what they taught us seeded my current stances, uh, again, in regards to our democratic republic. And I can totally agree with that. I mean, if, if our democratic republic function, functioned as we're taught in school that it is supposed to, I probably wouldn't be sitting here reading State and Revolution with you today. Right. Um, yeah, it, but, it's, it's funny how we've never reached that democratic ideal where we allow... Uh, such large powers to organize themselves autocratically, that being the, the, the private business interests. Uh, kind of weird how that works out when you allow power to all be siphoned to the top in one realm of life, but, but claim that, that in another, it's uh, everyone's on a level playing field. Yeah, and John said, uh, the national question means the elimination of all forms of oppression based on race, nationality, and ethnicity. It means the achievement of the reality in our nation where all people are equal, no matter what their race or nationality or gender or, you know, sec uh, sexual orientation, um, gender identity, even. Mm -hmm. And uh, he went on to say yes. BLM is realized mm -hmm. precisely. And then he, he re quoted that whole, um, pseudo socialist representatives of pseudo revolutionary pseudo democracy of being glaring departures <laughs> from democracy. Fucking yeah. solidarity, bro. Hell yeah. Are you reading along or did you just like pull that out of your ass? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, we're almost there. Yep, almost there. <laughs> it is extremely important to note that Engels, armed with facts, disproved by a most precise example the prejudice which is very widespread, particularly among petty bourgeois Democrats, that a federal republic necessarily means a greater amount of freedom than a centralized republic. This is wrong. It is disproved by the facts cited by Engels regarding the centralized French Republic of 1792 to 98 and the Federal Swiss Republic. The really democratic centralized republic gave more freedom than the Federal Republic. In other words, the greatest amount of local, regional, and other freedom known in history was accorded by a centralized and not a federal republic. Um, there's a footnote here. Engels, 1891, Introduction in Marx, Civil War in France, and Tucker, Marx, Engels, Reader. Hmm. I would assume that introduction was used in more than one work, judging on that, uh, on that footnote there. Anyway. Insufficient attention has been and is being paid in our party propaganda and agitation to this fact, as indeed to the whole question of the federal and the centralized republic and local self-government. So I just wanted to finish the section before I brought this up, but, um, you know, we like to talk about how our federal republic, as opposed to our centralized republic, how our federal republic uh, offers such great levels of freedom Right. But why is it illegal for a woman to get an abortion in Texas if that is the case? Right. 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 Yeah. So I'm trying to understand this, this distinction between the, the central republic and the federal republic. And I, and I think I have a handle on it now. So like the central republic is you have the, your base level units of, of government at the local level. They send a representative to the next level up, the next level up, the next level up, and then the the will of the people is then uh, reproduced in into the entire government, right? Uh, laws are made based on that. Yeah. Whereas a federal system is 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 kind of the opposite way. It's a top down where the the federal government, like we have now, 
uh, everything else is at the pleasure of the federal government. So if the federal government wants to revoke a state charter or, or, or whatever, then it can, or, or overrule the state, it can. And then if the, the state wants to overrule the, the local authority, it can do that too. I th am I getting that right, do you think? I, I think so, yeah. Well, then, then I'm definitely for the, the Central Republic as well, over the federal. Right. And, and I mean, again, I just, you already reiterated this more than once in this stream, but we need to, I mean, maybe like you said, start calling it a community or even a commune yeah. because, uh, for sure. I mean, the title of the book is a little misleading almost. If you, if you are trying to think about state and revolution, obviously the book is about the role of the state, but we're not talking about our current state. We're not talking about well, really, any current state outside of, what, there's five communist countries left? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I think a, a different term needs to be popularized. And no reason we can't do it. I mean, the, the, the left can co-op terms and, and use them to their benefits. We, we saw that a lot with... Uh, I mean, even saying words like based and stuff like that, you know, started out as an alt-right thing, but because, I mean, th that was a, a more of a unique case because most people didn't follow the alt-right and their talking points and their vocabulary and stuff. So if you co-opt their words, nobody knows any different. Um, but I think we can we can take different words and, and start referring to it as, as what we're talking about, to, to be more precise. And then if people press us, I mean, they're like, oh, don't you mean the dictatorship of the proletariat? You're like, yeah. Yeah, that is what that means. It's it's the same thing. It's it's ruled by the people. Um, I think that would be a good strategy, just to to make the messaging more clear that we're not talking about uh, one single person acting as an autocrat. Quite the opposite. Right. We need to move in the way of radical democracy instead of bourgeois democracy. Right. Yeah. Um, and again, I mean, like another thing that I'd really like to do a piece on in the future would be about com uh, about Cuba's sorry about Cuba's political system. Um, over the last several months, I've learned quite a bit about it. And I mean, don't get me wrong; I'm no expert. There's still a shit ton to learn. Um, but it, it's refreshing to learn about a system where, I mean, your 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 local seat of government is at the neighborhood level. Right. Right. And uh, mm, what was that? I can't remember what the number is called, but there's there's some number that some uh, anthropologist came up with. And it's like the basic, the, the, the most number of people that can associate with each other where you like, you know, everyone by name, um, you interact with them on a fairly daily basis. And, and basically it, it tracks pretty well with um, uh, with it with a neighborhood you know a neighborhood is basically the basic or the the largest social unit that a person can wrap their mind around and uh you know fully be a part of and anything larger than that so i think that's great that it starts at the neighborhood level as well that makes sense um right and i mean like i i understand why we why we critique it as a top-down system but mm -hmm. like in, in getting even a base understanding and how it actually operates. It's more quite the opposite. Um, I mean, sure, you got the president to rubber stamp things, but, you know, those decisions are made before they get to his desk. Yeah. 90% of the time. Yeah. 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 I, I'd like to learn more about uh, the, those social estates that have held on and, and how close to that model they, they actually work and practice um yeah that's just one area that i haven't looked into all that much myself seems, Same, seems like i've been i've been focused on uh you know catching up on basic theory really yeah yeah me as me as well i mean it, it uh, from the little i know of cuba it seems like they're they're you know fairly close to that sort of a model which is is one reason you see um the, the party in power getting what what is it, like 95 98 percent of the vote each time is because you know decisions are actually coming from the local level at least that's what it seems like i could be wrong on that but right right and i mean by all means if my perception of the cuban government is wrong i mean show me 
I'm I'm more than open to that. But no, I'd like to do a whole dive on it someday. But cool. Yeah, we'll yeah, see when we'll see, see when that happens. <laughs> yeah, future collabos. Yeah, I don't think I really have anything to add though. Um, I'm learning the a lot. Into this, yeah, the deeper into this book we get, the the less like questions or like statements of my own I, I feel like I feel like I have to make. Like he covered his bases pretty well considering that well, from our perspective, hindsight's always twenty twenty. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean at, at least the way he's laying things out, it makes perfect sense to me. Uh seems like I mean, if you could realize this sort of a vision that it would be a pretty great place to live where you'd feel pretty empowered uh, just by participating at the local level. So, yeah, that's cool. Very cool. Indeed. I just want to give a shout out to uh, Jam Tomb Bread Crochets and Strin Samusuni. Samusuni? Sam? I don't know. If I, I butchered either. that, I'm sorry. I just call them Strin. I, I have given up on the, the second half of the name. So, Strin, yeah. <laughs> Fair. Where were they commenting? For, and uh, they, they didn't comment. They uh, followed. Oh. oh, they followed. Oh, cool. Yeah, uh, uh, Strin and Bread Crochets have, have been in my community for, for a while now. So Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, go go check out if you if you're watching my stream, go check out for we are many dot org um, and find them on on Facebook. They have the for we are many uh, page as well as as a couple of different groups. Yeah, he's, he's pulling up right now. Go check out yeah. their stuff. Really great, great content, great community that that they've built there. Um, and I'm happy to be one small part of that. Yeah, I mean, well, okay. So first of all, don't search for support group. I still haven't changed this slide. Um, it's actually called the education and discussion group now and has been yeah. for, for like four months. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, that group has, well, we've taken our time growing it because we were kind of concerned about trolls, but, uh, you know, now we're well over 800 people and most of the conversations in there stay civil. Um, yeah, yeah. I yeah. Mean, we, we, there was that that brief period where the libertarians were we're making, trolling that one post yeah oh oh my god and you know bless, bless their hearts as, as they like to say in the south um, which is funny because we just shared it around to a few leftist groups on facebook uh, and let the chaos have, ensue yeah it was, uh, someone it must was, have been bored and, and trolling for some leftist groups to to go own which yeah I I would tend to think that that backfired. Every single one of them gave up. <laughs> oh, they, they, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, that's all they have. They they have their their five or six talking points. Get a you know, make your own job if you don't like the one you you are. Become your own boss because you know, that's just available to everybody. And everyone could just be an entrepreneur. We don't have to have people like, you know, serve in a diner. Yeah, everyone can just be a diner owner, or or uh, you know. We don't have to have workers for a trash collection route. Just have an owner. I mean, it, it, it's it's ridiculous. So that that's one of the, the one of the, one of the ones that I would say become an entrepreneur, as though we can all do that. And then uh, capitalism is so great because it's lifted so many out of poverty. Which let's just ignore China and the USSR uh, coming out. I'm mean, especially like the well. I mean both of those really coming out of of uh, uh, basically feudalism in in the ussr's case raising the the standard to the point where they were on par and even beating us in the space race within just a few years uh and then in china's case um having abject poverty poverty for 800 million people and bringing them all up out of poverty uh before the time that that they always like to refer to with um them adopting more uh capitalist policies or capitalist friendly strategies uh so yeah well i mean you know but if a billionaire tries to cheat on his taxes in fucking china then they seize his company and fucking throw him in prison i mean come on i mean that's definitely a step above what we got to so 
but but yeah yeah they they so once they've cycled through their like five or six talking points then they really got nothing else to say and they just get mad or bored and they just leave so <laughs> right right um uh, anyway though i i don't think i have anything else to add um cool it, i mean if you wouldn't mind uh pulling up the the facebook group the um left signal boost for just one second and putting it up on screen i just want to uh give a little plug to to what we're doing with that recently that's fair give me just a second here sure thing I'll stop that screen share so i can start a new one <laughs> All right, so so this is a group that I run on, on Facebook, Left Signal Boost. Come check it out. Really great community. Um, we do everything from memes to uh, sharing of, of different leftist content. We have a database that we've we've put together, also called Left Signal Boost. You can check that out as well. But the, the thing we're doing recently is we're having our second annual Lefties Award show. So, so uh in opposition to all the different uh, capitalist um, self-promotion sort of award shows, this is this is a, a from the the bottom up approach, and, and of course we don't take ourselves all that seriously. It, it's it's mostly for fun and for exposing people to more leftist content. But uh, starting in October, we're going to be opening up the nominating process. Anyone who's a part of Left Signal Boost or a part of Left Pod Posting, which is another group of mine, or a part of For We Are Many can nominate people in, in any of the categories that, that we are going to be putting out there uh, for the best. Usually if we'll take a category like YouTuber, so it'll be like the best um, single uh, YouTuber channel and then the best single YouTube video of, of the past year. Uh, and then we're going to have an award show. We're going to, well, I'm sorry, I'm jumping the gun. So once the nominating process stops, we're going to have voting, which again will be open to, to everybody. And we're just going to go by what the people want. And then we're going to have an award show day after Thanksgiving, uh, or U.S. Thanksgiving, I should say. And we're going to have uh, presentations of all the awards. If, if any of the creators actually want to show up, if, if we actually get that kind of uh, notoriety, then that, that'll certainly be a part of it. But otherwise, we're just going to hang out and have fun and, and uh, review some of the best content across many different platforms. I think last year we had something like... Uh, between 10 and 15 different platforms that we covered and, and this year probably even more because we have an even larger community this year so come be a part of that um it's really going to start getting going here in october so yeah just thought i'd give a plug for that sounds good i guess while we're plugging i will uh bring you into the For We Are Many Education and Discussion Group. Um, why, why is that a notification? Zero people want to post or comment for the first time. <laughs> Let me nice. review those zero requests. Yeah, yeah, better double check. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, well, actually, you posted this as a... Uh, it's probably a right wing psyop or cops. Yeah. Um, you know, so we're we're Pos posing as Antifa. Right. So we're discussing that. Um, obviously, we discuss um, our version of history, the version we were taught in schools. Um, we put our streams up there. Um, you know, like some of its memes. Uh, lots of lots of uh, news stories, you know, things that are happening. Um, actually, this um, we need to be listening to indigenous voices anyway, as I already said. But this uh, story right here, I think, is a pretty big deal. Uh, six tribes are suing the state of Wisconsin to try to stop the November wolf hunt. Basically, there was one in February. There was supposed to be a quota of 119 wolves, and 218 were killed. And furthermore, the tribes are supposed to get half of those natural resources. Um, and they're basically, for the November hunt, they set the cap uh, at 300 instead of the DNR's recommended 130. Um, mm -hmm. You know, which 
that 130 would ultimately be 65 because the natives are not hunting wolves. They're trying to call for an end to the wolf hunts. Um, you know, so basically they're like, oh, well, if you're not going to hunt yours, then we'll just double the quota and fucking, you know, the half quota is still, um, more than what was recommended by the DNR. But the, the point is though, there's a lot of things in here, um, that, you know, we try to have a conversation about fucking everything. Yeah. Ultimately. Um, definitely. Yeah, that's a yeah, good place. I guess I don't, I guess I don't got anything else to add. No, no, no that, that's perfect. Yeah. You guys have great conversations. So we try. <laughs> definitely. Um, the only one last thing that I actually do have, and then, I mean, I'm done anyway. Sure. Uh, Trisha wanted me to apologize to Zach and everybody in the audience um, for not making it on tonight. She's been trying to get her uh, carpet steamed for yeah. a little bit now, and, well, it took longer than expected, ultimately. <laughs> No problem. We, we got plenty of future chapters to cover and future books, so there'll be plenty more opportunity to to all collaborate again. So hope hope your carpets are are, are sparkling now. Indeed. Um, two two more comments because Joy is funny. Joy nom nominates me for best narrator and herself for most annoying commie. <laughs> uh wow yeah I, I guess if you nominate yourself for that then we, we gotta give it to you <laughs> i know right <laughs> oh man anyway yeah do you uh, have anything else to add or we got no, to wrap it up or I, I think that's that's good this has been a great conversation another great uh, uh read of the chapter and we'll we'll come back for part two next wednesday uh same commie time, same commie place. <laughs> Indeed. Solidarity. <laughs> Solidarity. <laughs>